everyone, this is Jennifer Beamer, owner operator of Exfoliate Dyed Art by Science, and this is episode two of our Iron Age textile series. And in this video, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Chain Repertoire or the operational sequence, because it's one of the things that I used to help back background um, my approach to my experiments with the loom that you can see behind me. Um, but what does this mean, right? Operational sequence. Um, basically, it's a sequence of operations that can be um, used as a methodology to see how something is made. So, for example, if you wanted to know how a piece of cloth was made, or if you wanted to see how a wooden bowl was made, you would start at the gathering of the raw materials and then the various kinds of tools and procedures required to make that end product and then that would be uh, the chain repertoire so um, you know there's some necessary steps and one of the things that you can do with the chain repertoire is sort of break down the technological sequence of how to make something by examining uh, the set of steps which are necessary the sets of steps which are totally optional and kind of where these slot into the sequence if you look at it very linearly. And so this helps us understand the hows of the way something was made. But I think importantly it also sets up the whys kinds of questions. Why did they do it like this? Or why is this step here and not there? Um, in archaeology it's a lot harder to get at those why questions because um, there's a lot we don't know. But it does give us something that we can use to explore why questions, but you have to have some awareness of how something was made in the first place. Um, and it's not always a straightforward thing. So um, in this video, I was going to expand a little bit more on how exactly I'm using the chain repertoire. And uh, we'll... Uh, kind of break it down into steps so that you can see um, how it has utility with academia uh, and beyond. So I've already described one way that you can view the Chain Repertoire, um, but another way uh, that has a more textile related relevance would be knitting the heddles. Now, I didn't do these videos the very first time I did the experiment um, with the warp weighted loom because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to record and I was not quite as judicious about my methods as I have become. But, you know, part of that is a result of having gone through it once and now twice. I'm a little smarter about how to approach these things. So the next series of videos I'm going to show you with some voiceover, a little bit about how you can break down the chain repertoire into these um, sort of like short sequences that can then be embedded into longer sequences that can then be further embedded into larger sequences. Um, so it lends itself well to being discussed at multiple levels. And um, knitting of the heddles for a warp weighted loom was one of the things that I seriously could not wrap my head around at first. It's not something that is immediately intuitive um, because when you hear the word knitting, uh, you understand that there's some kind of looping mechanism that's at play so that everything is kind of formed by slip knots. But when you add in grabbing warp yarns, and applying it to a heddle and making sure everything stays equally distanced so that you can have a shed to beat up into was beyond my ability to work out theoretically. And so um, I decided to look on the internet for someone to explain this to me. And I was lucky I did find one person, which I will mention at the end of the video. But it's something that... I struggled with and I thought that if I wanted to preserve my methods for the next time I wanted to do experiments, because this one's six months after the, well, eight months actually after the last experiments that I did, and I forgot a few things, um, but also it's a matter of preserving kinds of knowledge that would otherwise be visible and, you know, traded down through generations um, of practitioners, 
but because these things aren't uh, necessary for our survival, they're always at risk of being lost. So I wanted to add to the collective by showing you how I knit the heddles and um, breaking it down in this discussion, this overall discussion about uh, the operational sequence would be very useful for you. Now you've seen uh, those videos about how I knit the heddles by um, kind of showing how it works as, as a sequence and then kind of digging in to see how the different hand gestures and the way that I'm manipulating the yarn to form the heddles um, is still fresh in your mind. I wanted to kind of go in depth a little bit about how the operational sequence is useful for framing my methodology. Now, if you've watched the other two videos, you'll have a sense of this already. Um, and if you follow any of my research on academia.edu, or if you've been to any of the conferences where I've jibber-jabbered about this stuff, or you're a textile person anyway, um, it's important to have a way to structure what your experiment is uh, designed to do. And um, I wanted to look at how the different uh, tools at my case study sites could function together. But that's kind of a big deal. So um, if you were to break all of that down into the, the tiny little sequences and gestures and decisions that would be required for each of those levels, it really becomes overwhelming. So one of the things I did for my PhD thesis um, I sort of went through a um, kind of like a, a multi-scalar approach to look at Lumites as a collective and then pushing that more specific, I looked at them more as individuals and then pushing more specific, I looked at individual Lumites to see where there might be signs of wear and how this might be related to the overall functioning of them as objects that could um, weight down warp yarns. So I did that for all four of my tool types to kind of get a sense of what each kind of thing needed in terms of how, how you would do the operational sequence to get it to function. Um, but when you're coming up with an experiment, my belief is in order to understand what local production might have been like, you need to keep your focus set around a site or a series of sites that were probably cohabitating, um, so interacting with each other regularly, um, but also trying to make sure that I don't add anachronisms where they wouldn't actually reflect the kinds of production capabilities that would have been feasible for the area. So, for example, if at Danebury there was absolutely no evidence at all for flax, then I would have no business using linen as my warp yarn. But as I stated previously, there was some, and in a sufficient quantity to, su to suggest that at least some option could have been available for using it in this way. I'm not trying to prove that they did, but there is a suggestion that they might have. Um, and this is also corroborated by some of the evidence from Must Farm where linen is woven, although technically it wasn't draft spun and we don't know yet if it was produced on a warp weighted loom yet. <laughs> the report's not out yet. Um, 
that's suggestion enough for me to kind of use that information kind of creatively for my experiment to explore linen in this way. So I also needed to make sure that the lumates, the spindle whorls, and long-handled combs, I needed to see how they would all fit together as a sequence and not individually because it would be one thing if I looked at spindle whorls and the whole range of spun yarns that you could make with that but it wouldn't matter as much as knowing what kinds of yarns would also be suitable for the warp weighted loom given that the necessary requirements for loom weights might be different than what you might need for uh, netting or some kind of other you know final project that would require uh, a spinning or a spun yarn so um, it was important for me to look at how these sequences all interact with each other. So I led into this experiment with a lot of research, but because I have done that now, I can actually look at how all of these um, tools work together to create the sequence, which I'm calling um, a proof of concept experiment, because I'm not actually using the originals and I'm not using per se the methods, and I also didn't use hand spun, but I did confirm that all of this is possible given what was found on the sites. So even though my conclusions so far are very tentative, what I have been able to do is structure everything within this uh, intimate landscape to kind of show how the operational sequences for each different tool type can come together into this one big umbrella to work as one giant sequence, which we would then call textile production. Another thing I wanted to comment on really briefly, hopefully, um, was the role of crafter. And it's not really discussed a lot in experimental archaeology, although I think people who do engage with experimental archaeology are much more sensitive to it. In academia, we sometimes forget um, the role of crafter. Uh, in a lot of the things that we discuss, particularly when you start considering more higher level um, theories about the way society was constructed, um, you start to lose the individual. Um, but in later prehistory, when you sort of get more of that intimate connection with people, because you're, you're kind of in that proto-historic time period where, say, Romans are talking about Iron Age people, um, even if it's not a direct communication, it does kind of give you some sense of these people as having real identities that, that we can almost touch. Um, but with prehistoric archaeology, you have this conundrum where we want to know something about the crafter, but getting to know the crafter is really, really hard. Um, and part of that, I think, comes down to uh, the experience of experimenting doesn't really have a, a good methodology developed yet. It's in the works. There are a lot of people who are currently researching these topics to kind of understand the role of crafter and experience through these uh, craft technologies. But it's not really as widespread yet as I hope it will be. But one of the things that I have found really interesting during these experiences is how I am responding to the changes in how I do my setups and how I go about the sequence in the first place where um, sometimes I kind of oscillate between really paying attention to what I'm doing and other times it's just totally autopilot. Um, and it makes me think more deeply about the role of crafter, what people might have been thinking about it, it helps me uh, sort of deal with like the cognitive and visual aspects of archaeology. Uh, oh, sorry, of experimenting. Sorry, that's still not what I wanted to say. <laughs> it makes me um, deal with uh, the, the visual and the cognitive aspects of Iron Age people who are engaged in crafting, and I'm doing that by reviewing my experience as an experimenter. Whew. <laughs> got all that out. <laughs> anyway, so, um, you know, it's important to kind of 
keep logs of what I've been doing and sort of as I'm going through this I write down stuff that may not be immediately relevant but it gives me something to think about because they're, they come across as problems and I'll, I'll tell you one thing um, it hasn't it doesn't bear relevance to the main aspect of the experiment question I'm looking at but one of the big problems was how do I attach the warp threads to the beam to get a really dense piece of cloth that isn't tablet woven so there aren't any tablets at all recovered from uh, Iron Age Danebury and that's not to say that they didn't have wooden ones because they, they may have but wood does not preserve in those soils so uh, we don't really know if they did and so one of the challenges has been well if I don't use that how else do I attach it and so I've over the the times doing this and I've taken photos and recorded myself doing these uh, various actions is solving problems from the crafting perspective and it may seem kind of um, ungrounded but actually there's a lot to say about the role of crafter in making these decisions and how these decisions um, are more than just functional so how I view the way that I put these things onto the loom bear relevance to the next time I do this experiment because if I'm not happy with it then I try something else and when I do come across something that I like why should I change it if it doesn't have any relevance in my world so uh, these these uh, experiences kind of get embedded through practice or tradition and it's important to kind of recognize that within archaeology so um, even though I can't say that my experience is a proxy for the past um, I can say something more about how the role of crafter can be uh, influential over how things are done because they have a greater sense of what the purpose is so I just recently gave a paper that's specifically talking about purpose because in the research I've done so far with my thesis and also the experiments I've done it has foregrounded the relative importance of crafters in our discussions so using the operational sequence doing the experiments based around that and understanding the whole context of production in this way has been influential to me looking back at the archaeological record and trying to contextualize it in the way that it ought to be done not because I want it to be you know this way of production it's specialized or it's just household just household but you know what do these things mean and you know when we talk about differences in say a loom weight shape or if it's made out of clay or chalk are they real differences so it gets you discussing more than just how some how something is done it, it gives you a framework in which you can look at methods you can develop theory you can look at how things interact and you get more of that social component that uh, the purest sense of an operational sequence doesn't really get at um, so you know there's there's a lot to be said for having framed my research this way but also it, it shows how much more we need to be doing um, academically to develop the notion of craft and experience a little bit more In this last section, I just wanted to comment really briefly about the role of crafter because they are the most important aspect of any technological sequence because they're not just being guided by the sequence itself, they're, they're negotiating various realms that bear impact on them, whether it's political or religious, economic, survival, all of these 
influence the reasons they do this or the the ways that they go about producing something so it always makes me think about myself as a crafter and how I think about my ideas as I'm working through a craft and it doesn't matter what kind of craft it is I am thinking about how I feel while I'm doing something. I'm thinking about the colors, I'm thinking about the potential, I'm thinking about the amount of perfection I want to put into something. When does something feel done? Is it just because it's a certain length? If, if it's developed a, a certain amount of wear, you know, these objects are constantly in a state of evolving because they're coming into contact with humans and other you know, me, like as an individual human, other humans, it's coming into contact with other kinds of objects. Um, they can be viewed in different types of worlds. And so I, I have to recognize that people in Iron Age were very, very clever. And I know I've mentioned this in the past, but we don't give them enough creativity or a sense of creativity that I think they deserve. And so by doing these experiments, I am confronted with that sense of creativity um, and cleverness that these Iron Age people must have possessed. And it's not just Iron Age people, everyone has. Everyone has the capacity to be very creative and that's part of how we've been able to survive so long because we have this um, creative ability to kind of take our world and shape it and manipulate it to what we want it to be. And it doesn't always make sense, but it's how each of us as individuals are kind of reacting to the things in the world, um, but also acting upon. So it's not just inert, it's sitting there waiting for us, sure, but also there's this relationship developed. Um, as I stated, there is an influence based on the technology as a sequence and how as a sequence of tools coming together to make a textile can bear on um, the way that you go about making the textile in the first place. The same thing goes with uh, the crafter as the, the ultimate coordinator of the sequence. So if, for example, um, you've read something about how coarse weaves were worn in the Iron Age and everyone wore scratchy wool and you start to think about that statement and you think, if people were really wearing such awful wool, don't you think they would have come up with a creative and clever solution to that? Yes, they would have, because no one wants to wear something that irritates their skin. There's no way. So I think sometimes we get lost when we think about um, Iron Age or prehistoric people in the um, simplicity of that era because it's so temporally different and distinct from us where we don't we don't live in iron age roundhouses we don't have um, issues with gaining food especially in the developed worlds so i think that by going through these experiences it really does foreground the importance and relevance of the crafter and how their creativity and sense of style or aesthetic can really interject into the technical sequence. So even if we can't physically see it, we, we know that it must be there. If you think about um, some of the problems I've had with uh, setting this up initially, I didn't know how all of these tools could be used together. And so I had to do a lot of research to figure that out. But if you grew up with this, you would have that cognitive behavioral understanding. So you would have been taught various aspects of the chain repertoire growing up. You would be told either specifically or through stories or through life lessons, how things are done and why they're done the way that they are. And it's not just because everyone is mindless fitting to some tradition everything is backed up for a reason and it all seems very plausible and so they continue going through with this but it's not to say it's without change because it certainly did have you know individual uh expression and you can see that sometimes when you look at the difference in loom weights 
Just because a region makes them one way or another doesn't mean they're totally different as groups of people, but also doesn't mean they're necessarily totally the same because you have different crafters making specific changes for whatever reasons um, that then kind of develop into these uh, local differences. Um, and how we're interpreting those local differences needs to carefully respect the textile production sequence as a whole because you have to be careful about how you um, take the sequence of one area and apply it to another um, because it sort of detracts from the differences that might have been there in the first place but it also doesn't respect how different groups of uh, people in the same society might have uh, viewed themselves in contrast to another group in a different region and um, that kind of leads into this whole idea of like cognitive archaeology and the visual aspect of textile production. Just in the sequence that you've seen in this video, you get a sense of uh, the complexity required to do something that seems very simple because I can say it in a few words, knitting the heddles, or knitting the heddle in this case, because I just did one. Um, so it's not that... Um, you learn it once and you're proficient. And it's not that you learn it as an entire sequence and then you're expected to do it on your own. What it comes down to is this uh, reinforcement behavior. So seeing it a lot, doing it a lot, over an extended period of time, you become proficient in all the different levels. And because there might be some crafter influence where someone might be more innovative with the way that they're attaching uh, something to the um, the top beam, or they're experimenting with different color combinations or pattern weave setups. We're not giving them enough credit, I think, where it might be due, and it is a little dangerous to speculate too much, but I don't think it's wrong to say that Iron Age people who were engaged in textile production were very, very creative. Um, and by doing my experiments the way that I'm doing and using the uh, Chain of Pertoire as a base for the study really foregrounds um, that complexity and the visual aspect because as you saw with that complexity, I couldn't just remember how I did it the first time and I had to look at some of my videos and photos from last year to see what I did but I originally went to the internet and found um, Rolf Verberg, sorry if I say your name, um, because he had a very, very short clip uh, showing how he did it. And he worked, I think, from the right to the left, and I'm, I work from the left to the right, for whatever reason. <laughs> Maybe it was because my dad's left-handed and I grew up kind of doing things with either, depending on who taught me. Um, but. I couldn't remember based on my one experience or even two experiences because I, I did two sets of experiments last year. Um, and so there is this uh, visual aspect that must have been there to kind of embed it cognitively within uh, various types of people in this community. So by types of people, I mean whether they're children, whether they're boys or girls, uh, whether they fit some other gender that we have yet to really discuss in Iron Age Britain, um, if it was a matter of necessity. So there are some aspects of the operational sequence for textile production that would extend beyond what we would traditionally want to say was women's work because we can't say with any real verification at Danebury that textile production was women's work. Also, at what stage do you call it women's work? And so I think by understanding creativity and understanding that it was probably very visual in, this cult in these cultures, um, people would have an awareness and might in certain circumstances have to step in and do some of the work because that's necessary. So. Um, yeah, I'm just glad that I can contribute a little bit more to the visual aspect of uh, knitting the heddles for a warp-weighted loom 
um, because there's not a lot of information out there and the more that we can get out there, the better, in my opinion. All right, so that pretty much wraps up this video. Uh, the next video, I'm going to go more in depth about uh, how I made certain kinds of substitutions for my setup and go more into the core of what my setup was for this experiment, um, in part because I'm actually writing up a draft of this paper so I can kind of talk about things simultaneously, which is super useful. Um, and if there's anything that I feel I can interject while I'm setting up the next experiment, um, I'll have an opportunity to um, do more videos, uh, close-ups, things like that in the future uh, as well. So, thank you for watching this video. It's educational and a little bit long and sometimes a little dry. Um, but if you are interested uh, in seeing the next video, please post below with any kind of feedback, suggestions, comments that might be useful for the production of the next video. And uh, I will take that into account. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please do, because it does support this channel. The small little trickle of funds that comes in is useful to um, pay for the things that I've had to buy to upgrade my um, filming situation. So I got a new camera, new light, um, and I think I might have to uh, think about uh, some other <laughs> upgrades as well. We'll see. Because <laughs> one of these days I'm, I'm going to uh, do some streaming, but I need a few more things to make that possible. But anyway, um, like, share, especially if you are already interested in experimental archaeology or you uh, are part of an open air museum or you are a reenactor, I'd like to hear your feedback and thoughts on these videos because um, I'm trying to bridge the gap between pure academic stuff and pure, um, you know, I'm doing this because I want to do it type stuff. So, um, yeah. That would be super useful, and I would appreciate it a lot. <laughs> anyway, thank you for watching. Bye.